In 1981, as the Cold War raged on, Nellie Kim was interviewed in English at the World Championships in Moscow by British TV while they were covering the event. Nellie's long and illustrious career as a gymnast had come to an end the prior year following the Olympics, and her gregariousness, ambition, and drive were on full display. It's easy to see why she would become one of the most influential figures in the history of women's artistic gymnastics. And now I'm preparing my competition on the floor and on the beam to exhibition to other countries and of course in England. Come on, English lessons. Lover or hater, there is no doubt that Svetlana Vasilyevna Horkina is one of the greatest gymnasts the sport has ever produced. She was a mainstay throughout three quadrennia and even competed far past her peak until the age of 25 in the hopes of winning that elusive Olympic gold medal in the all-around. I'm pretty sure by the end she was subsisting solely on nicotine and hunger, both literal and figurative. Throughout the span of her decade-long career, she amassed an incredible 20 individual World and Olympic medals and another 14 individual European ones. She won the all-around at World and Europeans three times each, and she won two gold medals on uneven bars in back-to-back -back Olympics in Atlanta and Sydney. I can't think of anyone who was more passionate about gymnastics and gave everything they had to the sport while they were competing. She was one determined, legendary legend. What I personally loved about Horkina the most, other than her personality, was her incredible innovation and originality. She and her coach Boris Pilkin, may you rest in peace, were quite the dynamic duo. Under Lester Tutelage, she may have been a middling all-around gymnast to then just cleaned up when it came to bars. Or, Perhaps infamous British Eurosport commentator Monica Phelps said it best at 1994 Worlds. Who would think such a frail physique could uh, generate so much power? When she retired in 2004, she had a record eight skills named after her. However, in the year of our Leah 2023, if you were to go to the FIG's code of points, you would only find four of those eight elements and the other four had just vanished. If you're thinking, hey Wally, that seems awfully suspicious, then you would be dead right. So let us look at the four skills that are still currently in the code of points. On vault, we have her round off half on, tucked one and a half off that she introduced to the 2000 Olympics. Such an exciting moment when she unveiled that. And then it turned to the worst of nightmares just a couple days later. On bars, there's the stalder Shapashnikova with half turn to grab the high bar that she first did at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. And then we have her two skills on beam. Her gainer full twisting back handspring that she first introduced at the 1994 Worlds in Brisbane. And the gainer two and a half twist off the end of the beam first performed at the 2001 Worlds in Ghent, Belgium. So, what were the other four skills and where did they go? And for that, I think it's helpful to look at the timeline here. We must first go all the way back to 1988, which may seem a bit bizarre, but I think it sheds a lot of insight into things that happen later down the line. During the 1988 Olympic all-around final in Seoul, Soviet legend Nellie Kim was one of the judges on vault, where she was representing the Soviet Union, obviously. Daniela Silevash had a slim lead over Yelena Shushanova going into the final rotation, where coincidentally they were both on vault. Daniela went first and a perfect 10 would have clinched the all-around for her outright. She stuck her first vault, but there were a lot of issues with it, including a lack of power, a severe leg separation in the pre-flight, and the vault is a bit piked down as she lands it in the after-flight. Personally, I think a 9-9 is probably the highest that any judge should have given that vault. Remember, in 1988, judges could only score in increments of one full tenth, so you could only do a 9-6, 9-7, 9-8. You could not score like 9-6-5, 9-7-5, 9-8-5.
like they can now. But we all know gymnastics is a subjective sport, and considering Silivash had the reputation that preceded her, it's not surprising she got three perfect tens. Not to mention the fact that the scoring in Seoul was kind of out of control. <laughs> let's be real. So let's do a poll. Do you think Nelly Kim was one of the three judges who gave Silavash a 10? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. If you said, no, dumbass, <laughs> she has a bias towards her countrywoman, you would be right. But Nelly took it to the next level. She sat there with a straight face and scored Silivash a 9.8, the only judge to do so. And of course, one of the judges, Nellie Kim, somewhat embarrassingly gave Silivash a 9.8, which was really a low score. Thankfully, it did not affect the result of the competition because Daniela would have scored a 9.95, whether Nellie gave her a 9.8 or a 9.9, it wouldn't have mattered. Shushanova went up after Silivash and she ended up getting a perfect 10 and snatching that all-around gold away from Daniela. Even though Yelena landed a bit hunched over with her chest down, it was a better vault in almost every other metric. So let's talk about this incident with Nelly. Was her giving Silivash a 9-8 camp? Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of camp. I got a trick of my sleeve. I start that the crowd will be Leave. But was it cheating? That may be a bit more nebulous, but personally I would probably lean closer to yes. The more important question is, should this person even be considered for one of the most important roles of your sports governing body? Apparently the FIG thought so, because two months after Horkina hung up her Leo in 2004, Nellie Kim becomes president of the Women's Artistic Gymnastics Technical Committee. And what is the first thing that she does? She completely overhauls the scoring system into the current monstrosity that exists with us to this very day. What an explosive finish to the women's competition. Who cares, eh, about a fall on the beat when you can tumble like Vanessa Ferrari. When the FIG released the inaugural open-ended code of points in 2006, there were a couple of remarkably interesting observations I uncovered. As I mentioned before, the number of eponymous working skills had been halved, down to four. Also, at this point when Nelly took over, she had zero named skills in the code of points. But in what I'm sure was merely a coincidence, when the next code was put out three years later in 2009, Nelly Kim suddenly has five named skills. And apparently that wasn't enough because in the subsequent iteration in 2013, a further two more were added, bringing the grand total to seven. Kim skills, all of which were added retroactively, which isn't a thing in women's artistic gymnastics, unless you're president of the WTC, I guess. I have only seen name skills added after the fact when they had been in the code of points originally, but then taken out due to no error of the gymnast. This is what happened with Tatiana Tujikova in her full twisting double layout on floor. So for Nelly to do this, I almost have to applaud <laughs> the audacity because, wow, <laughs> unreal. So of the four named Horkina skills that were lost, two of them were just unceremoniously removed from the code, taken out, no bye, no aloha, just gone. Her first eponymous vault, introduced at the 1994 Brisbane Worlds, was a round-off, half-on, piked cuervo off. A cuervo is a half-turn off the horse and then into a back somersault. It's similar to a barani, except the twist happens before you flip. All cuervo vaults were eliminated for safety concerns. Safety concerns. So surely the handspring double front vault was taken out. Nope. Still there. Hmm. Interesting. Sometimes ignorance truly is bliss, as I thought Horkina only recently lost this vault when the FIG decided it didn't matter when a twist happens during a skill. 
Pokopaeva introduced a similar vault a year after Horkina, only she did a Barani in the post-flight as opposed to a Cuervo. I thought the FIG had just combined them into one and unfairly named it for Lilia, considering Svetlana performed her variation first, but it turns out that Horkina's first vault had been missing for a very long time. <laughs> Horkina also had a bar skill which she shared with Amy Chow, described as a stalder backward to handstand with one and a half turn in handstand phase to mixed L grip. In the 2006 code, the FIG removed the L grip distinction at the end of the move and an eponymous Horkina skill along with it. And not just Veta, but poor Amy too. Just catching strays because the FIG has this vendetta against Svetlana Vasilyevna. I am legitimately livid on her behalf. It's probably the empath in me. So let's get to the last two skills no longer named for Horkina. And these are probably the two most contentious ones because they are still currently in the code of points unchanged. On floor, Svetlana did what was described as a leap with one and a half turn in horizontal plane, legs together, landing in front lying support, taking off from one leg. She first did it at the 1997 World in Lausanne, Switzerland, and it appeared named for her as a C skill in the 2001 Code of Points. In 2006, the skill is still there only it's been devalued to a B and her name is nowhere to be found. I have been told this is because a skill must be of at least a C letter value in difficulty in order to be eligible for naming distinction. The problem is this is either A, a lie, or B, incompetent, because Silivash's B rated B mount was still named after her in the code until very recently. I complained about this double standard on Reddit last year sometime, and in another incredible coincidence, when the code was updated late last year, Silavash's skill no longer had her name on it, despite it definitely being in the first version of the code. So if anyone associated with the FIG happens to stumble upon this video somehow, I want to helpfully point out that Liu Xuan's One-Armed Giant, which was also rated as a B skill, again for safety concerns, is still currently in the code of points under her name. In the sense of fairness, I implore you to either remove her name or preferably add back both Silivash and Horkina. If you have a name skill, I think you should have it in perpetuity. It feels wrong to take away people's name skills. Sometimes that's all that they have to show of their contribution to the sport. Also, while you're at it, could you please correct the spelling of Carly Patterson's first name? It just looks unprofessional. Are the governing bodies of all sports this embarrassing? Because there really is no excuse for these kinds of things, in my humble opinion anyway. So that just leaves us with the last skill, and I am stumped over how this one no longer bears her name. In the 1997 code, the FIG described it as handstand on high bar, circle swing forward in reverse grip with half turn and straddle flight backward over the high bar to hang on high bar. This is what is known in MAG as a Markolov. The wording in the 2006 code is a bit different. It now says swing backward with half turn and straddle flight over high bar to catch high bar. Now, bars is notoriously my nemesis, but the diagram looks the same. The symbol is literally identical. It almost seems like the wording was changed just enough to take the skill away from Svelana Horkina, and that's just not cool. Please correct me if I'm missing something on this one, because it is rated a D value, which is enough for the naming credit. I have no idea how they could have taken this one away from her. So what does this all mean? When you look at the big picture and see how the FIG took away half of Horkina's eight named skills, I love that ball. while simultaneously adding seven named skills for Nelly Kim out of thin air, most of which A 
She wasn't actually the first one to compete the move, even in an eligible competition. B, there is no video evidence of her successfully landing the skill. Or C, the type of element isn't included anywhere else in the code. I would say of the seven Kim skills, two are actually legitimate. Maybe three if you include her dismount from the 1980 Olympics. Although I have a feeling it wouldn't have been allowed hit anyone but Nelly performed it. Honestly, one of the skills doesn't even have a letter value assigned to it, so it's worthless. It's in there strictly for vanity purposes. It just all seems a bit, checks, notes, corrupt. Now, I can only speculate that Nelly Kim is actually the one behind the erasure of Svetlana Horkina from the Code of Points. But is it really that unreasonable of an assumption or speculation? Who else has any kind of a motive to tarnish a rival's legacy, even if it's just on paper? This targeted attack on one of the greatest gymnasts to ever compete in our sport, if not the very greatest, seems very sad and misguided to me. Not to mention low-key evil. I wanted to put this on record because much of gymnastics history is not exactly well kept for one, the FIG isn't exactly the most responsible or transparent governing body. It is up to those of us who have a passion for preserving the days of yesteryear and showing how gymnastics has evolved from the golden days of the late 70s to mid 90s into whatever it is now. If you keep the masses ignorant, they will not know any better and they will expect mediocrity. Unfortunately, that is true of history in general. I hope this video will be able to stand as a tribute to the myriad contributions that Svetlana Horkina has made to the sport of gymnastics. I doubt we will ever see Svetlana Vasilyevna in the International Gymnastics Hall of Fame. I most certainly do not condone everything or practically anything that she has said, but even the vilest person is capable of creating the most beautiful art, and I think that it should be allowed to speak for itself. There's been a lot of discourse lately about is it possible to separate the art from the artist? And if the artist is a bad person, by transference does that mean that anything that artist created, be it actual art, music, film, are those all tainted due to the character of the artist? I absolutely think it is a very nuanced discussion to have, but for me personally, I don't think it should bear any impact on the art itself. And if you think about it, in the days before social media, did you really have any idea what your favorite artist thought about X, Y, and Z? Of course not. It didn't matter. It's irrelevant. I think this all comes back to parasocial relationships and people wanting to feel like they're friends, I guess, with their idols. And everybody knows, never meet your idols. There's a reason that that is such a common phrase or mantra, right? Thank you so much for watching this if you made it all the way through this video. I really appreciate it. Honestly, I do. If you liked it, please hit the thumbs up. That really helps me and it helps YouTube let people know that people like my stuff. <laughs> please subscribe if you want to. No pressure or anything. I just hope everybody has a great day and take care of yourselves. I will see you later. Daskorva. Bye, loves.